Genesis 28, <clears throat> this uh, Bethel that Jacob was told to go to, and then he took his house to, uh, the story began in, in, verse, in chapter 28, start with verse 10. Let me read this real quickly so we get the background here. And Jacob went out, this is uh, Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put for them his pillows and laid down in the place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up uh, on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God descending, um, ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your fa thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereupon thou liest, to thee will I give it. Uh, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and uh, will keep thee, I'm sorry, yeah, and keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. And I, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awakened out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up for a pillar and poured olive. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I read into the first there. <laughs> poured oil upon the top of it. And he called. I'm sure it was olive oil. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of the uh, city was called Luz at the first. And Bethel doesn't tell us what Bethel means, but just a few verses earlier, he said, this is none other than the house of God. And if you research what Bethel means, it means the house of God. Okay, And uh, uh, El, of course, we understand means God, so that makes it easy to understand. Bethel. Okay? And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way, the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that uh, thou shalt give me, uh, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. Now, this is the, the reference that's being, being given there in Genesis 35 about this house, Bethel, the house of God. Interesting, honestly, I didn't even notice this until just now, but he talks about, I will give a tenth unto thee. And in so many ways, I see this as like a picture of the church. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, but this house of God, right, the place where they met with, uh, with God. And so here, here is the, uh, here's how God met with his people in places that is considered the house of God or the house of the Lord in the Bible. Now, to begin with, from the very beginning, he had what we would call the patriarchs, okay? Uh, he would just meet to them in a special way, Abraham, Jacob, as we see right here. And he would meet to them in a special way, and he would say, uh, you know, uh, go to this place and build an altar unto me, or whatever, you know. And this had been the case with uh, Noah, and, and, you know, this was just how they met with God. There was some form of altar. We don't get all the specifics in the early chapter, but I suspect maybe even, maybe even Adam was taught this by God. And probably he taught his kids, Cain and Abel. And this is why we see Cain and Abel bringing offerings to the Lord. I mean, I don't know all, all we don't have all the details there, but I'm saying this is just how it met. God would, would show up and talk to them and say, you know, hey, build an altar unto me or whatever he would tell them to do. And it would be a holy place where they would meet with God through a vision or something like that. This was the house of God. And then later we see established the Levites. And the tabernacle, and they were told, you know, in the times of Moses, you can go to Exodus uh, uh, 20, I think, 22, I think is where they start talking about how to go about building the, uh, the tabernacle. A tabernacle is just another word for a tent, okay? It's a temporary dwelling place. And they would actually pack that thing up every time God would move and tell them, okay, follow this pillar of cloud and, or a pillar of fire by night, and it's going to lead you to where you need to go. So they would close up, uh, pack everything up, 
only the Levites would have specific jobs and they would carry the, the tabernacle, all the elements that were inside the tabernacle, the holy uh, uh, instrument, uh, instruments and everything. And they would carry that to the next place. Then they would set up the camp. They would put the walls around there and inside they have the holy of holies and all that. Very similar to what would eventually become the temple. Okay, so you read that. David says, hey, I want to build a temple. God says, nope, you're not the one. And Solomon ends up building a temple. And this is called over and over the house of God. First, all through 1 Chronicles. Uh, and 1 Chronicles 6, by the way, the tabernacle that I was talking about is called the tabernacle of the house of God. Okay, so, we're, so it was still referred to the house of God. And sometimes you'll read and like David will, will talk about the house of God and you're thinking the temple. And then it's like, wait a minute, the temple hasn't been built yet. But the temple and the tabernacle were basically the same thing. This is where God would choose to meet with them. This would be the house of God. And then uh, all throughout you know, the rest of the Old Testament, there's the temple until the temple is later on destroyed. Now, obviously, uh, another temple's built. It's still called the temple of God. But when Jesus comes on the scene, or rather, I should say, after Jesus ascends up to heaven, you know, he says, hey, this temple, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And so he institutes something else that's the house of God, that's not the, tab the temple or the tabernacle or the special place that God would lead them to or whatever, but it is a place that we call the church, all right? Look at 1 Timothy 3.15. First Timothy. Now, right then, the words that came out of my, my mouth, I instantly knew I said something wrong. And I wonder how many caught that. But I said, we have a place called the church. Some people probably said, ha ha, the church isn't a place. The church is a people, right? <coughs> and I agree with that. But let me read this. First uh, Timothy 3.15. Oops, I'm in the wrong book. <coughs> But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, whatever the church is, from the time Jesus left and uh, sent it up to heaven and said, I'm going to send her, and then the, his disciples went and started the church. Whatever that church is, it's used all throughout the New Testament, and it's, a, and it's, and it's people getting together together. And an assembly. So nowadays, what we like to call that is the local church, all right? Meaning there's a local visible place where people meet and they come together. Hey, this is the place where we meet, uh, you know, to, to worship God and to hear from God and all that. And it might change throughout the New Testament. They would meet one place. Sometimes they'd meet in another place. But ultimately, there was a church that met in, in uh, Corinth, a church that met in Jerusalem, church that met, you know, uh, Antioch and all these places, there were a people that came together at a location. And when they assembled together, which is what church means, a congregation or an assembly, when they assembled together, that is the house of God. That is the place where God is meeting with them at that point. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You could say, uh, you could use that. And uh, basically when when God's people come together and they congregate together, uh, they are the house of God. All right. Now, in this message, I'm going to talk about going to church, going to church. And that would offend some people. <laughs> oh, you don't go to church. OK, in fact, I started I, I was telling uh, Thursday, I think I was telling Brother Justin about this. Maybe some other people. I don't know, because it's when I study something, a lot of times it's on my mind. And I can't help but tell everybody about it. And so I was reading this. I don't know how I came across it, but this guy was talking about what they called micro church. There's always some kind of gimmick out there where they're trying to start some kind of new infrastructure, you know, of of how the church works. But this is called a micro church. So instead of a mega church where everybody has to come together and meet, you know, in this building of 2,000, 3,000, 10,000, I don't know how many are in Joel Osteen's church nowadays. 50,000, 100,000, <laughs> I don't know how big it gets, okay? Uh, instead of all these people gathering together in one place, here's the mindset. And apparently this came out of the whole COVID situation and people, you know, not being able to meet together in one, one body. I, I believe this is where it started. Maybe it had already started, I don't know. But the idea uh, had changed to, hey, let's, since we are the church, 
let's take the church out into the community. And so they'd meet together. A similar idea to the old, you know, nothing's new under the sun, to the old like church house mentality where, I mean, uh, house church mentality. So they would go into these houses or the, you know, hey, you want to go to the coffee shop? You know, hey, we'll go to the coffee We'll sit down and we'll have a little Bible study and we're taking the church to our cent- our community of friends, you know. And there's some great things. I, I enjoyed some of the things that they were saying. I was like, well, in, as far as evangelism, outreach, stuff like that, I think some of those ideas are really good. And they did have a place where they would assemble together and all that. I'm not trying to pitch the idea of the micro church, <laughs> but I'm saying when I'm researching the micro church, and I looked at a particular organization that uh, has several of these micro churches, and it's all saying, you know, if you want to be part of the church or you want to start a micro church or whatever, and it's saying all this, but their slogan was, you know, something along the lines of, you know, we don't go to church, we are the church. And that sounds real great. And I understand what they're saying. And I could even point to some verses in the Bible and say, I understand what you mean. This is what it says, what it says. But let me tell you this. We also go to church. (laughs) When you get up in the morning and you get ready, you say, hey, where are you going? We're going to church. We're going to the place where we're going to assemble together with God's people. And the purpose is it should be. The purpose is to hear from God. The purpose is to serve God, to worship God, to, to come together. You know, no matter what happened throughout the week, certainly we don't go to church every day. So whatever happens throughout the week, you know, we got to leave some of that stuff behind. Some of the things we might have made some mistakes and say, hey, I want to get that right. I need to go hear from God. And this is a similar idea to what happens in Genesis 35. <laughs> Jacob is in a a weird situation here and he ends up going to church. Now, I want to make uh, a few points here. That's a little bit of a, a little bit of a stretch. Okay. I'm I'm reading things out of this passage that we can all apply to ourselves. Okay. Uh, But I think, I don't think I'm uh, doing it injustice. Our families have to come together and assemble together as one family, and, uh, and that is what's called the church. So the title of this message is just simply, Your Family and Your Church. Your Family and Your Church. I know we talk about the family at home, and I know we talk about the church family when we come to church, but I want to talk about your family and the church, okay? And here's the responsibilities. Now, I've been preaching a lot about the family lately. And Iola, last week we started, um, I guess that would have been two weeks ago on a Sunday night. I started, it's just, it was just the, the, the first part. I think there's only going to be two parts, okay? We talked about the family unit. And then tonight, Lord willing, I'm going to preach on uh, investing in your family, all right? And some of that, the study and everything that, that I had was, was because when I went to Illinois, the topic uh, of the... The, the month, I guess, uh, there in uh, Liberty Baptist Church was the family, basically the focusing on the family. And so I was preaching on the family and I began to think a lot about the family unit and, uh, and just different things uh, came to mind about this. And so this idea about our families, one of the things that I want to stress in this message is that our family you know, like I'm going to stress tonight, there's a lot of investment that needs to be put into our family, but our family is going to only prosper and do right when our family it goes to church, when our family is under the, you say, well, I don't know. I know some good families and they don't go to church. Okay, that's fine. But I guarantee you, if they're not going to church, they're not meeting uh, the, the spiritual uh, requirements that their family needs. Right? This is why God instituted the church and said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. This is why we have to go. So here's a few things I want to draw out of this uh, passage in Genesis 35. Number one, the head of the household should take his family to church. Okay, guys, if you have a family, you are the head of the household. It's your responsibility to get your family in church. Now, uh, immediately, if there's anybody maybe listening online or anybody in here who says, hey, you don't know my situation. That's true. I'm not preaching to you. Everybody's got their, I mean, I'm preaching to everybody, but everyone's got their own situations and I'm not trying to pick on anybody in particular, but here's the biblical principle. You want your family to work out. You want your family to be right. You want to, you know, to, to, to be strong. You've got to make sure 
your family goes to church, okay? Uh, one of the things I preached on in, in uh, Illinois was uh, the idea of suffering, like our life. I compared it to the, an ultra marathon, right? So going through our, li our life as a Christian involves a lot of struggles and trials and suffering, right? And the Bible even says there will be tribulation. If you're, a Christ, if you're a Christian, you know, you will go through some suffering. But the point that I wanted to make in that particular message was, but we've got some things that make our suffering a lot easier, okay? We've got God. He gives us instructions. He helps us along the way. He provides us with benefits. It makes that suffering in life a little easier. And then I said, also, he gives us, if we're lucky, he gives us a wife. He gives us kids. And that helps our life. It gives us purpose. It gives us an enjoyment, something to share it with. And it's all great. And the world says, hey, I want to have a family like that. Most people say, hey, that's wonderful. I wish I had that. But no, very few are willing to do the things that, would require, that are required in order for them to get to the point where they actually enjoy their family like that. Does that make sense? I, I, would, I would like to say everybody enjoys their family, but I don't know that that's always true. <laughs> some people don't enjoy their family. And uh, sometimes people have even parental relationships or, uh, or even spousal relationships where they're divided at home as to what the will of God is or whether they even care what the will of God is, whether they want to go to church, they don't want to go to church, all these things. And there's division. And so ultimately, the head of the house Hold, it's on your shoulders, and I know that's difficult, and I wish I could stay and also preach to you what I'm going to preach in Iola tonight, because maybe that would help out a little bit, uh, but, but it is your responsibility to take them to church. Now, listen to this. This doesn't mean that you're perfect, you know? How many have ever heard somebody say, the reason I don't go to church is because there's a bunch of hypocrites, or the reason I don't go to church is because... My parents made me go to church and I watched their life and they weren't perfect. And so church must not work or something like that. Whatever the reasoning is, it's like this weird, uh, weird notion that we go to church because we're like perfect people that live in a perfect world. And, and that's why we go to church. And if you don't have everything perfect, then you wouldn't go. To, you don't need to go to church. That's crazy. OK, everybody lives messed up lives. If you don't believe me, read the Bible and look, pick out the best families in the Bible. You're like, hey, this is a great, I'm preaching from the family of Jacob. You know, the 12 brothers, Joseph, they tried to kill him <laughs> or they wanted to kill him and, and so, you know, I'm talking about a dysfunctional family and I'm preaching about Jacob saying that he, God said, hey, I'm going to bless you and, he, and, and Jacob messes up and then he still has to do right and get back to, uh, to the Lord. So here's what he says in uh, verse one. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Do you see anywhere in that verse where he says, Jacob, I want you to take your family to church. I want to take, all right, let's just say Bethel, okay? <laughs> I want you to take your family to Bethel. Everyone in your house, take them to Bethel. He might have said that, but I don't see that in the text. He's saying, Jacob, I want you to go to Bethel. But in verse 2, we see what he does is he just naturally takes his household with him. Okay? And so that is that should make sense. Now, if you follow the background, chapter 34, one of my favorite stories, by the way, if you haven't ever read it, go back and read it this afternoon. That's your homework. Okay? I love the story. Dinah goes out with the, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you the Cliff's notes. Okay. <laughs> Dinah goes out with the daughters of the land and uh, ladies night out or whatever. And she goes out and uh, meets a handsome man, she uh, uh, Shechem, who's a prince, you know, and no doubt the ladies of the land are like, Oh, look, he's looking at you. Look, I think he likes you. Hey, you need to go talk with him and all that. Long story short, they end up doing something that, was not okay thing to do for an Israelite, okay? Or, or, you know, anyone following God, God had told them not to do that. And so by their perspective, Shechem defiled their, uh, all the, the brothers' perspective, Shechem defiled their sister, okay? So they took matters into their own hand 
And you got to read the story, okay? But basically they go out and they end up killing a whole bunch of people and, uh, and really like stirring things up. Now we could point out the faults of Jacob because Jacob clearly had made some mistakes along the way to get his family in that predicament, you know, where he's got all these brothers who are fighting against each other, where he's got these two brothers that get mad enough to go kill, you know, all these people. That's kind of taking it an extreme because, by the way, Dinah, it's not like Dinah was raped. I don't really believe that. You read the text, looks to me like she was, she was like co-equal. And then she's like staying in the house, and it doesn't seem like she wants to, to even leave later on. So uh, that's the way I read the story. But the brothers take it upon themselves because, hey, they defiled my sister and they go out and slay all these people and everything. And now Jacob is thinking, oh, man, now what am I going to do? You know, now we're going to stink in front of all these people. These people are going to look at us and think, hey, these are wicked people. And so he's like, what am I going to do? He's got this turmoil. Okay, Jacob is uh, made a lot of mistakes with his kids, no doubt. He's made a lot of mistakes with his wife. And then he had another wife, and he had two, uh, two of their handmaids. You know, he's got children with all these different women. That would get you in trouble, okay? Having children with more than one woman or being in a relationship of any sort of, of that sexual nature or whatever with more than one woman, that's going to cause some problems. That's going to mess up that perfect family life that you wish that you could have one day. That's going to mess it up. But it doesn't matter. Jacob still needs to get back with God. And he needs to go to God and say, what do I do next? And the fact that God even goes and talks to him, you know, and says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Bethel, the house of God, right, where you once went. And so he packs up and he, believe, and, and he leads his, his whole family. Look at verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. And change your garments. I'll stop there for a minute. But notice it said he took his whole household. The word family, I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, but in my studying here the last couple of weeks on the family, I looked up the word family and I was kind of surprised about this, but the word family comes from a word that has to do with servants. Okay. And you're thinking, what does a servant have to do with family? All right. In the 1500s, there was no word uh, family that had to do with like the man of the house and the wife and the children. Basically, the word family meant like a household. Okay, it means everybody in your house. That's your family. So the reason it had it was tied to the word servants is because a lot of times people had multiple servants or handmaids or or or, or uh, you know, just various people, servants of different types in their house, this was considered their household as well. And so even when God gives laws, he says, hey, this is going to be true for everyone that's in your house. When he told Abraham, hey, you're going to circumcise uh, everybody in your house, that included the servants. That included the people that he had bought with his money and said, hey, I'll put you up in a house and I'll take care of you if you'll work for me or whatever. He had to make sure that they complied to that rule as well. How does that apply? Well, I have been in the ministry long enough and been in church long enough to know that there's a lot of people who are dedicated to church. They go to church, man, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or in this case, Thursday night or whatever, and they go to church every time the doors open and everything. But the moment that they get family from out of town that stays with them, you know, they're like, well, I'm sorry, I can't come because I got family or something like that. And, uh, and, and it seems like, hey, wait a minute, man. You're the one in charge of your household. You know, take them to church with you. Now, sometimes people don't want to go. And there's, you know, that's, that's your own fight, okay? I'm, I'm not, I can't settle everybody's individual issues, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And I think that the Bible makes it clear that the man, the head of the household, is the one that God's going to go to and say, hey, it's on you. If you get your family in church or you don't get your family in church, that's on you. That's your responsibility. But you're still, you're still held to that standard of holding your, church, uh, holding your household accountable. Okay? And so the head of the house must rule his house and insisting that they go to church uh, whenever the doors are open is reasonable. Okay? And it's reasonable that they would... Uh, uh, insist that people staying with them even would go to their house. I mean, to the, to the church, okay? 
And then if you are the one who lives in a house and you're not the head of the household, okay, whether, you be, whether it be the, the wife, children, you know, you're staying with somebody, you're living in somebody's house or whatever, you know, here's the deal. If you're living in somebody's house, uh, and this is another reason, like from the biblical from the biblical role that God gave in the family, I'm not a fan of, hey, this is your account and this is my account. You have your money, I have my money. And then it's like at some point, like the house is like divided. Like if they ever, if they ever got a divorce, God forbid, like they would immediately know like, okay, well, that's your stuff and you take that. Pff, forget that. When you're married, what's yours is mine and what's mine is yours and and, uh, and, and, you know, it shouldn't be like that. I believe in joint accounts. I believe in sharing everything. We even share a Facebook account. <laughs> I'm not saying you have to do that, but I'm just saying, I believe, hey, you're, when you become one flesh, you become one flesh, all right? And so that household, uh, it should be like, hey, well, you're the head of the house. What do you say, you know? And the head of the house has to be willing. And it's, uh, it's almost like God, God did this at the fall, at the fall, right? In Genesis 3, it's like God, part of the punishment was the guy, he's going to be the head of the house. <laughs> it's like a punishment, okay? It's not like, well, we'll let him be the head of the house because he's the most capable. <laughs> no, it's like it was, a, if you read between the lines, it's like he's saying like, yeah, you know, your desires are going to be unto your husband. It's like, this is part of the punishment, okay? Because normally, I'm telling you this, it is easy for guys to be like, well, I don't know, wife, what do you want to do? You know, and the wife's waiting for you to say, hey, here's what we're going to do. Now, she might complain after you do it and say, that's not what I wanted to do. But still, she's waiting for you to make a decision. <laughs> OK, <laughs> not that that would ever happen in my house, but <laughs> everybody looked at Valerie for some reason. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Like, like there's going to be someone that's got to make the decision and all the other people, whether they like it or not, they've got to say, well, he's the boss. What does he say? Now, I found whenever I was a kid, this made it super easy. Now, I wish that every kid would just be like, yes, I'm going to church. I can't wait to go to church. I, I want to learn about God. I want to go soul winning. I want to do all these things. But a lot of kids, particularly teenagers, seem to get to this point where they just don't really have a desire to go to church. Like, I'll go because my parents are making me or whatever. But I remember how this would play out for me as a kid is I would have to make some... Uh, my parents would give me some standards. For instance, I played baseball, right? Different, various sports. And they would say, okay, if your practice is on a church day, you can't make it. You have to go to church, right? Now, that should have been my own conviction probably. And I should have said, hey, sorry, boss. I got to go to church. You know, and this, is a, this is a church day or whatever. But when you're a kid, it's easy to say this. Sorry, my parents require me. Like, I don't want to. I want to practice. But my parents said, I got to go to church, right? And you, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> I would rather not be that way. But doesn't that take a load off? You're just like, I'm just doing it because my parents parents said. I don't know. Again, I'm, I get uh, confused about where I said what. But uh, recently we had somebody who uh, their mother wanted to start coming to all the services. And her work acquire, required her, you know, I don't know what, how that worked out as far as what days she got off or whatever, but she said, I want to be able to go to the services, but I always have, they always schedule me to work on Sundays and Thursdays out here. And so he, so then she went to her boss and said, Hey, I'd really like to be able to go to services. And they said, well, you can, you can get, you can get uh, certain days off for religious purposes, but you have to provide, if it's a religious purpose, you have to provide like documentation about, why your religion teaches that you can't work on this day. And then you got to get like somebody to like authorize it. And all there's just all this rigmarole to be able to get that off. And I said, well, we got Hebrews 10, 25 that says, forsake not the assembling yourselves together. Right. And so write that down as your documentation. I'll sign it. <laughs> and then give them one of those cards that say, these are the days that our church meets. <laughs> right. Sundays, afternoons and Thursdays. Now, some people are, have already got themselves into a situation and you've got to obey your boss and you got to do right and, and you don't have that luxury to do that. I'm not trying to make you feel bad or something like that. But I believe that a pers the person in charge of the house has a right to make that rule. Say, you know what? You're living in my house. 
You're not going to work on Sundays or you're not going to, uh, you know, have to skip church because of that or whatever. It's perfectly okay for the leader of the house to make that kind of thing. And I'm telling you, if you keep your family in church, it's going to be a much better family than if you don't. <laughs> okay. Things are going to go much better. They're going to be much easier. Am I, I'm not talking about being perfect. Okay. Jacob wasn't perfect. He had a lot of problems with his kids. I'm not saying the kids are going to be perfect. I'm not saying you're going to be the perfect uh, uh, parent, but I'm saying if you make the mentality, my kids have got to be raised uh, knowing what God's word says and knowing about serving God and worshiping him and being involved in their church and you enforce that, it is going to go well with your family. The second thing we see here is that there should be preparation made before going to church. Preparation made before going to church. Again, I realize I'm reading into this a little bit. You'll have to give me a little bit of liberty on this, okay? I once heard a preacher say this. I think it was Brother Collins said, preparation for church begins Saturday. Oh, turn my alarm off and, and say, oh, I don't know, what am I going to wear and, and all that kind of stuff. He, he said, you know, I think it's good advice. You prepare your heart Saturday. You say, hey, you know, I can't wait to go to church in the morning. I'm going to get my stuff ready. I'm going to get it laid out. I'm going to take my shower. I'm going to get my heart prepared so that when I go to church, I think it's so backwards that we have this idea like, you know, we're going to preach uh, a sermon and we're going to try to get everybody, you know, just to fall on every, hang on every word that we're saying as a preacher and, and listen to us. And, and we're trying to bring them all the way to the conclusion of the sermon so that we can give an altar call and they can decide, you know what, I need to get my life right. You know, it'd be far more better, than, more better, far better than that is to start on Saturday and say, I want to get my heart right. That's why I'm going to church tomorrow. And pray to God and say, God, forgive me, you know, of the faults, uh, the failures that I've had this week. Help me start afresh. First day of the week, Sunday, let me go to church. Start with a clean slate. And then you go to church ready to listen. It's not just like, well, let's see if he can impress me. Let's see if he can get me to actually want to do something for the Lord. You know what I mean? Decide you're going to do that before you ever go to church. But I believe that preparation should be made. And I find this interesting. Look at verse 2. He says, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way uh, which I went. He says, put away the wickedness. Look, some people hang on to certain sins certain wickedness, certain lifestyle, and they go into church like knowing they have no intention to change that area of their life. And they go to church and they listen to the preaching and then they walk out of church and they go right back to whatever that sin is that they're involved. Hey, you're going to go to church for a reason to meet with God. So you, you, you must get that out of your life before you meet, you, you can expect to meet with God. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Bible says, David says, the Lord doesn't hear me, right? He's not going to listen to you when you're regarding iniquity in your heart and you have no intention to, uh, to get right with him. Look, he's not interested in that kind of worship. He wants somebody who comes in, no matter what mistakes you've made, but you're going to come to him with a clean heart and say, I want to get this right. You know, wipe those sins away from me and help me get on the right path. I want to listen to you. I want to hear from, uh, from the Spirit and I want to uh, do right. And it says they change their garments, that's a good idea every once in a while. <laughs> Wash your garments and change them. I hate suits, man, because you can't wash them. You got to do the cleaners and it's anyway. <laughs> but I think there's something to be said about, now I'm not saying everybody has to show up to church in a suit. Okay. I, as the pastor getting behind the pulpit, I like the idea of having a suit on. I think it's it's, it's a good practice, not by any means is it a necessary practice or something that you can find specifically in the Bible, but I think it's a good practice. And we go so far as to say, if you're going to be up here, like to read the Bible, uh, you know, before the sermon or, or even to some degree, take up the offering or anything, you ought to try to look nice. I'm not going to set a necessary standard. If you're going to be up here to preach, you know, I ask that you wear a tie, a shirt and slacks. Uh, but none of that is like, 
because this is God's requirement, but it's just like, hey, we want to present our best to God. Right? This is God's house. We're going to take it serious. We're wanting to meet with him. And so we want to do our best. And so this is the idea. Hey, we're going to go meet with God. So put away your strange gods. They, ought to, they better put away their strange gods. But look, not everybody that was in his house was just a godly person. Right? So he had to say, look, we're going to go meet with God and you aren't going to do such and such. Right? And some parents need to be willing to say to their kids, look, I don't care what you think. You're going to go to church with me and you're not going to do such and such. You're not going to take such and such. You're not going to wear such and such. Okay, and look what they did. It even goes on here. It says, uh, verse uh, 4, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. And I don't see where Jacob asked for this, but and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak uh, which was by Shechem. You say, what about guys? Did, what, did guys wear earrings back in the Bible days? Well, sure they did. Read uh, whenever they're bringing all their, uh, uh, all their things to, uh, to Moses, or, or even I think whenever they're building the, uh, the uh, golden calf, right? What did they give to Aaron? All the gold that was on them, and they gave them their earrings and all that stuff. Of course, they were also uh, slaves in Egypt, okay? And slaves are, are the earrings is something that slaves wore. But they're coming and he's saying, hey, I don't know what was said to them or whatever, but he said, take out that. And I, th I take it like this. Take out that worldliness. Now, I don't, I don't see that a lot in our church. Praise God for that. I mean, occasionally there's a new Christian or somebody who's still learning some things. You know, we give grace. Uh, we better give grace, you know. But I've been to churches where people come and they're like wearing all these flashy clothes and all this gaudy jewelry and all this kind of stuff. They've got all the worldly trends on and they're doing all this stuff. And I'm like, I remember at Bible college, by the way, in, uh, in, at BBC, I first went to Bible college and I had heard that, hey, there's some things that they, a lot of the people do there that are differently than the churches that I grew up in and everything. But I remember them going on a Wednesday night and dressing up and going to church. And I was like, where are you guys going? Are you going to the club or what? They're like, no, man, we're going to church. We got a, there's like a, a rock concert, you know, or something that we're having tonight at, at the church or whatever. And I'm thinking, you look exactly like you're going to a rock concert in the world. When you're going to meet with God, it should be different than going to a, a, a worldly attraction. <laughs> and so I think get rid of the worldliness. Get rid of the, you know, don't go to church looking for the world type of music or the world type of dress, or the world type of, even vernacular. I get so sick with these trendy churches talking about, hey man, I'm so stoked about, you know, we're going to really rock it out tomorrow, and, and all this stuff, and I can't even think of the vernacular because I don't speak like that, but I'm just saying, and they say that, and they're like, hey man, that's just so cool, and I'm like, grow up. You know, you're 60 years old, and you've got a ponytail in a ball spot, all right? <laughs> Act your age. <laughs> And in fact, don't who cares about your age? Act godly, act different, act separated from the world, okay? Now, you, you, you're going to reach everybody. You're not going to be judgmental about everybody that you meet who, who looks worldly, obviously. You're trying to reach the world. But when you come into the house of God, it's okay to say, you know what? We're going to look a little different. We're going to act a little different. We're going to get away from worldliness. Getting my worship on, man. <laughs> No, you're not getting your words upon. You're getting your worldliness on. Preparation should be made. Change the garments. Put away worldliness. Finally, now look, please understand, I'm not, I'm not talking about being holier than thou and like looking down your nose on everybody. If you're doing that, that's gross. That's sick. I mean, that's, I'd rather you be a worldly Christian than be that kind of a Christian, to be honest with you, okay? But if you're doing things unto God and you're doing it God's way, there's going to be separation. There's going to be a distinction. Okay. And here's the last point that I want to make. People should know your family goes to church. I remember one time going to uh, an outside activity, uh, a fair or something like that. And, and, uh, and we met somebody there who goes to our church and we were talking to them in the process. Somebody else came up and they, they knew them. And so we all started talking. They're like, oh, I didn't know you went to church. <laughs> right now, I understand that happens. All right. I remember a, a, a guy meeting a guy uh, on Facebook and we, he was talking about what high school we went to. We went to the same high school and he was like, and you're in the ministry. He's like, 
man, I'm trying to think. Like, I thought I knew all the Christians in my high school. No, I remember just like a knife, like just, I wanted everybody to know I was a Christian, right? But uh, you fall into the whole trend, the worldliness, and sometimes people don't see it. But look, I think it's right for everybody to recognize, hey, that person goes to church. That person loves the Lord. That person's different. You ought to be weird in your neighborhood. <laughs> you ought to stand out. There he goes to church again, right? Again, not because you want to be holier than thou, but because you love the Lord. If you love the Lord, you will stand out because the world doesn't love the world. They love them. I mean, love the Lord. They love themselves. Look at verse, uh, let's see, four. And they gave Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hands and all their earrings which uh, were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak uh, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. <laughs> now, this is partially because two of their sons had just like slain, you know, massive amounts of people with the sword. Okay, so... There was a fear of the Lord. So I'm not saying like, uh, like they just all said, oh, these people are so godly. But do you know, even though it was wrong and they went too far, do you know what their motivation was? Hey, these worldly guys aren't going to defile my sister, right? And they stood up and they had a zeal for the Lord. They kind of messed up and they went too far. Jacob, you know, he's got four different women that he has children with and he's doing different things wrong. And some of the people in his household have gods, uh, you know, I mean, look, there's a lot that you could say about him, but one thing they knew, hey, we know about the God of Jacob. We've heard about the God of Jacob. We know about that family that serves the God of Jacob, <laughs> you know, and they understood, hey, that place over there, Bethel, that's the house of God. I mean, that's, uh, that's where uh, Jacob met with the Lord or, or whatever. You see what I'm saying? People in the community or people that knew them knew that he was all about serving his God. And I think that uh, as Christians, we want to lead our family as the best as we can. I know, I know people have different situations, and some people might not even be, might, might not be a husband who's the head of the household, or they might not be in that kind of relationship. Uh, whatever the case, I, I, understand, uh, uh, I, I understand that people are going to have to apply this in different ways. But here's what we know is that the family is going to be stronger, and it's going to be uh, uh, more enjoyable and more beneficial, you know, to, to, to your life as well as to serving God and doing His will if they're in church. And the head of the household needs to make that decision to take his family to church. Preparations should be made before you go to church. You should come to meet with the Lord and, and know that you're going to hear from His Word and you're going to make a change in your life. We don't do altar calls. You probably noticed that. I don't do altar calls where at the end we just play 50 verses and people come down and if nobody comes down, we play 50 more verses until somebody comes down. Like, I'm not about that. You, when you walk away from the message, I'm hoping that if it got through to you, it got through to you. If not, come next week. You know what I mean? But, uh, but I'm hoping that that'll happen. And, but you have to prepare your own heart. You need to be ready to hear the word. And then finally, people in the community ought to know that you go to church. Uh, they ought to know, hey, that's that guy that's always giving me invitations to his church and he's always preaching the gospel to me and he's always, he's always wearing those KC Mission shirts. What's that all about? A little plug for the KC Mission shirts. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Like, oh man, there they go, dressed up for church again. And uh, I hope that makes sense and you understand. But this is kind of some application I got out of that story and about our family and the importance of our family and church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, for your word, and thank you for the church. I thank you, Lord, that you have uh, that you died for the church, and that you gave uh, evangelists and preachers and teachers to the church, and and that you have a, a will and a desire that the church would go on and do the uh, the work that you've called us to do. So help us to take it seriously. Help us not try to find the new trends and the new. Uh, uh, infrastructures, what, what way we ought to look and how, uh, uh, what church trend we need to jump on, but help us just realize that the important thing is that we meet with you, we do it your way, we give you our hearts and allow you to change us and to uh, change our families and help us all grow. And I pray you will be glorified with all the families in this church and, uh, and, and those looking for, for uh, 
uh, spouses and, and such, Lord, help them find the right ones that would be dedicated to you as well and help them uh, meet their goals. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.